Um, we'll begin. And Tom, if you don't mind sharing the slide deck, we'll begin. Greetings, everyone. My name is Clyde Tabor, and I am part of the Media to Movements Coalition. And we're very excited to welcome you to our event where we are sharing the results of our third survey that kind of globally looks at how Media to Movements is being used around the world. So we're very honored that you're here. And again, for those of you that are just coming in, we are recording. If your security is a concern, turn off your video and use a pseudonym. So I'm here in Southern California. I am the director of the Visual Story Network. And I also am a part of the Media to Movements Coalition. Um, here's how we're gonna spend the next 75 minutes together. Um, we're going to, and you can advance, Tom, we're gonna to describe the Media to Movements initiative and what do we mean by that? We're gonna look at the key findings from the survey, do some Q and A. We're gonna look at two case studies, one from Africa, one from Asia, a panel discussion, and then lots of resources to help you take your first or your next steps. Um, next, Tom. In 2019, the coalition was formed. It started at EMDC, by the way. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, and the respective organizations on this slide have been meeting monthly. It started with a smaller group and it's grown over these last now, what, four years. And it's been extraordinary because we work together to foster this this practice that's been used around the world and is growing quite, quite rapidly. Um, in addition to these coalition sponsors of the survey, we also have some additional co-sponsors and we wanna do a special shout out to the Jesus Film, Strategic Resource Group, the Coral Trust, Media Impact International and Pioneers. One of the projects, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So this, since since this has been going on now for quite some time, one of the things that's kind of emerged is this ecosystem. And I'm not going to explain it, but as various practitioners have started doing things, and then people started sharing, and then this coalition is formed, and best practices emerge, there's this ecosystem of just really saying, hey, how can we all do this together and be better together? And so it's exciting to be a part of that. Um, so this network re represents teams, organizations, communities of practice. It's quite extraordinary. And we guesstimate there's a couple thousand of you that are, are doing this around the world in one way or another. Next, Tom. One of the projects that our team, this coalition, has undertaken voluntarily, again, we're not a, an official organization. We're just a voluntary association of people committed to this practice, is we do these global research projects. So we did one in 2020. And that URL, and this maybe is where you could help Allison and drop those links into the chat. Uh, and if you guys want to click on the chat and open them up, and you can have them in your browser window that, to look at later. Um, the second one was in 2021. That URL will take you to the results from that. And we skipped a year. And hopefully within the next 24 hours, we'll have the executive summary for this year's research. Um, this year, again, the research was led by our friend and colleague, Dr. Frank Preston, who you'll be hearing from. The full-length report, the recording, the notes, the slide deck, uh, resources will all be found in that this um, executive summary, and that's that last link. And if you can drop that one in there, if it's not there already, Allison, great. And then we want to provide you with resources that will help you. So amongst the various partners, tools, websites, resources have emerged. And one of the places you can find them is that last link. And if you could drop that in, Allison, visualstory.org forward slash M to M. There are, there's dozens of resources that you'll find, ways to onboard. If your media to movement specific resource is not there, it's a wiki. So it's a Google Doc and you are free to go in and add that even while we're meeting today. Uh, next, Tom. So we're going to move into our report. We're going to hear first from Tom Kazoyan, who is with MMU, Mission Media U, and Pioneers, and a variety of things. And then um, 
Tom has been for seven years our primary instructor for our courses on media movements within media, Mission Media University. Rebecca Lindsay is a team leader and a coach for media movements, but she's with East West. And Dr. Frank Preston is a part of the media to movements coaching team. So Tom and Rebecca will be giving us an overview of what do we mean and what does it look like around the world? What are some, some of the current metrics? And then Frank's going to give a 15 minute presentation on this year's results. And then we'll have a Q&A. But let's first watch this short video that gives an overview of what we mean. People are searching for everything online. Good recipes, advice, quick fixes, and not so quick fixes. Mm -hmm. Even answers to some of life's biggest questions. As people search for answers, we want them to find gospel truth and connect with people who can disciple them. Because the reality is, people are asking whether someone is there to answer or not. God has given us digital media to share his good news with the world. Because people everywhere are already using it. That's why now is the time to leverage media to start disciple-making movements. We call it Media to Movements. Media to Movements is the strategic use of digital media to identify people on a spiritual journey to Christ and connect them with disciple makers, who, in turn, equip them to reach their family and friends with the gospel. It starts here. But really, it goes back to this. All for the sake of the gospel. It's happening all over the world Explore how media can accelerate disciple-making where you live. Well, we are uh, ex excited to have everyone um, here today. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is give just sort of an overview of the, the idea of media to movements as a paradigm. And some of you are really familiar with this. We talk about what we call a funnel. And I want to start without the funnel to show why the funnel exists. You know, each of us has got this passion to see people who are who are seeking answers to faith, who we want people to, to be seekers, and ultimately we want them to become reproducing disciples. But often in many places uh, that we work, it's uh, it's a challenge because we don't know how to connect. We don't know how to connect those things together. And there's there's many things we do over many years that we've trained to do. But the media to movements idea, the 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 feeling that we've had in the last number of years is that um, if we have a shared vision and commitment between many players playing different roles, we can see this happen. And it, it happens in media movements. The media piece of it is just the fact that everybody's using media. Um, people are seeking media in different places, even places where the internet is not always on. People are using media in different ways. And we can leverage that media to identify seekers and to bring them into a discipling process. And so the top of the funnel is this idea of taking the media doing things like social media advertising and other ways to engage with people, but it's not enough to just have media out there and people watching interesting videos about Jesus and things. We want to make sure we can engage with them and say, okay, when you've seen this and you've had questions, we're making questions, we're making connections between seekers and disciplers and disciplers and seekers. And so usually we think of this, we, we call it a follow-up management system or some kind of online engagement or perhaps offline engagement based on the media. And so it begins to connect people together. And the, the important piece that we want to say to complete the funnel, to make this really effective and fruitful, is a coalition of people who are doing follow-up on the ground and having face-to-face -face meetings and training people to become reproducing disciples so that the natural outgrowth of the discipleship is reproduction. 
It's reproducing groups of reproducing disciples in, in different ways. And what we want to emphasize as we think about case studies and what Frank is talking about today in our, in our research, um, each piece is in, important and interdependent. So if you're a media entity, that's an important piece, but it's not the end of everything. If you're a follow-up person, you're, you have a heart to sit with people face-to-face, -face, that's really important, but maybe you can use help and can become connected with people who are doing media and, and doing online kinds of things. And so it's really important that we think of this as a whole and we think about how we can work together and see who God has brought together with us to do this. And the other, last thing I wanted to say is that it's a, it's a picture and not a prescription. There's no magic formula. There's no checklist that says this is going to do this if you do this. But what we are seeing is how God uses some of these ideas, brings them together, and we're seeing fruit in the world today. So that is the, that's the thing that we want to talk about and rejoice to see how God is doing that today. So I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca. Great. Um, so I just want to share with you a project that has been um, being developed over the last uh, year or so. Um, so we're referring to it as global movement metrics. And I'm just going to show you a live view of what this looks like um, and the resources this is, that this has been uh, to teams across the world. So as we get deeper into the research, you'll get to see um, all of the different teams that we've saw, seen contributing over the last year. Um, in this, you'll see that there are 55, 55 teams currently contributing to global movement metrics. Um, each of these metrics were selected by practitioners as what was the most valuable thing for them to see in order to see the growth and the progress of their projects. Um, and so these are from practitioners saying, here's what we want to monitor to see how is this growing uh, throughout the world. Um, so I mentioned that difference between what we're seeing on global movement metrics and what we will get to see when Dr. Preston shares the research. Um, and part of the reason I mentioned that difference is because this is still an ongoing project that we would love for people to continue to contribute to. Um, this isn't a complete picture um, because there is some activity required, but what we really see this is at, is as an opportunity for stewardship. A lesson learned from a, a team that we've heard from in the field was that when, before they were keeping track of these records that are represented here, um, that they were doing okay until they got to the point where they really needed to scale. Um, and so they were just looking at it as an opportunity to steward the souls that they were meeting with in a way that would provide them to do exactly what Tom was just referring to is groups of disciples making groups of disciples. Um, and so I want to show you real fast just a second view um, that gets a little bit deeper again into these metrics and um, then also show you that this is um, a third party collector of all of these different metrics. Um, and there's also a, in a significant emphasis on security. And so you can see here that all of the identifiers have nothing to do with names, uh, places, anything like that. But each team has been given a um, signifier that is completely anonymized. Um, and you can come in and, and a new feature is adding in your logo. logo. And this view really gets to um, just give an opportunity for prayer fuel, for funding resources, things like that. Um, so if you're seeing this and thinking, oh, I know of a team that would um, may, may not be represented in these numbers currently, but would love to contribute, there is a process for doing that. And we would love to invite you to do that or invite you to share this with someone else who may not be on this call. Our goal is for, by the end of Q2, to have 75 teams. So you've seen 55, but really, like I said, just kind of an opportunity for stewardship um, and get to see and celebrate what God is doing throughout the world. Um, and last thing is the teams that are represented here have six different signifiers. Um, and so this is something that's very easily accessible in some of the resources that you'll get. But a core team of two plus with a multiplying church plan activating a plan to catalyze prayer, contextually branded media platform, um, strategic conversations with seekers, a follow-up system, offline. 
So if that describes someone that you know of and would like to contribute, we would love to have you. Awesome, Tom and Frank. I'm sorry, Tom and Rebecca, now to you, Frank. And you are muted. muted. Thank you. There you I, go. I'm muted. Thank you very much <laughs> for allowing me to be part of this process. This is the third year, uh, that, I mean, third time we've actually done a survey. And one of the things I'm very impressed by, and you can see it already in, in embedded into the conversation so far, is that we are interconnected international coalition. No single person is behind this, no single organization is behind this, but we're a very interconnected coalition. And that's a real body of the Christ sort of thing. Go ahead, Tom, to the next. Um, two things are important for the research project that guided us, and that is what's called trajectory, which is uh, the view of an initiative over time. And the next one is the health uh, of initiative, which is the vitality. And we want to make sure as we go through the whole paper and do the research project, those two guided our conversations. Go ahead to the next one, Tom. Um, the, um, go ahead to, to coalition. Now do the next one. We're looking at trajectory. When we first launched our first research project, we knew the teams that were involved in the process, around 73 of them. And then in 2021, we had 128. Again, it was teams that we knew. As the, as the whole, act, whole movement has grown, we are starting to lose control as to who's out there, who's the teams, and, what, uh, and, which, and, and their growth. So how do we determine how many teams are involved in the work? We do this by working with the software that was developed by Gospel Ambition. Uh, Rebecca mentioned it called Disciple Tools. Um, and this was specifically was designed for media movement practitioners. Uh, currently there are 845 active uh, instances of the uh, Disciple Tools that are being used, but some people have been very creative in using it for some purposes other than media to movements. But we do know that within the Disciple Tools, there's a plugin called Facebook Plugin, which only just media to movements people would be using, media movements teams. And we have 260 instances of the um, Disciple Tools plugin on Disciple Tools. So we know for solid fact, 260 teams are involved in media to movement strategies. We also know from the survey research that only 55% of our total uh, coalition or people who are out using the team are using disciple tools. Some people are using Excel sheets, some people are using uh, Google sheets uh, and their ways of keeping up with their data. So the number of teams that are involved in M2M -M is significantly higher than 260. We just don't know that number. It could be double, it could be triple, but we're excited that the God is causing it to grow. Go to the next one, Tom. Um, the other thing that's interesting about what we've learned so far is that we're rapidly growing to non expatriate. And that is fun, that's exciting. Our first research project done uh, showed that there was around 78% of the teams were expatriate. And then uh, this year is showing it to be around 68%. The nationals are growing uh, as an opposite of, a, of expatriate, but there's an interesting growth in what's called not sure. And that's basically our teams that are near culture reaching out and they're not sure, am I a national or am I an expatriate, but they're just near culture. But the way that we can make a determination as to how what our population is like is looking at their English language. Who, which ones are using English as their first language? What we did in 2021 and 2020 was, was also uh, larger. 78% of the population are, um, are English first. Then it dropped to this year to 68%. One of the things we realized after we launched our survey was that it was done only in English. And our African counterparts, our South Asia, Southeast Asia counterparts, and even those in Russia, did not, could not speak, did not understand English enough to conduct a survey. So had it been multilingual, we would have probably saw that our population would have been around somewhere around 55% or maybe even uh, half or even bound 50%. So we are rapidly growing to expatriate, non-expatriate. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tom, to the next one. Are you froze? 
One of the key, if you can see this coming through, we're interested not in producing a product, but we want to have a strong outcome and an impact of ministry. We want to see church planting movement started. We want to see the gospel expand. So a very key interest is what's the impact on outcomes of ministry. In 2020, um, we saw that it was really heavily weighted into the moderate and the level four level, uh, uh, level four. But in 2023, there was a jump in significant, probably close to 150% people who said this is significantly impacting our work. We're seeing more people come to faith. We're seeing more people participate. But we wanted to see how many people, what, is a, what, what does significant mean? What does impact mean? So Tom, go to the next slide if you don't mind. We ask a question saying, okay, how about your engagements uh, uh, over the last uh, over five different categories one to five and since we're looking for significant we wanted to see what quite a lot which was number five what was their impact to quite a lot and we saw impact on an act online engagement which is which is to be seen it's to be it's, to be, it's, it's normal uh 45 was in 2021 and we're seeing far more engagements in 2023 up to close to 60 percent but we're seeing a 400% increase in going from not just engagements to now moving to face-to-face. -to -face. And then when you get face-to-face, -face, we're seeing professions of faith also about 400%. And we're seeing an increase of probably 100% so on baptisms and then involvement in fellowships. And what we're observing here is that now we're moving further closer to movements with teams. We now have two near movement teams that are in our coalition. And we hope to probably in the next year to see also more movement activity occur. You can see both the reproduction, multiplication, and starting of churches is a growing edge. And we will probably dis we'll discuss a little bit later on, but we need more help in guide helping our teams be coached into movements level. Go on to the next one, Tom. It's one thing to see growth. It's another thing to see a healthy growth. So we are very keen to look at how healthy is our teams uh, in doing uh, in their strategies. Um, so one of the ways to determine health is if a team is doing media movements as a one off on their team strategy or they're saying, you know what, this is really making an impact. We want to embrace this as a team strategy. And what happened for 2020 uh, and 2021, it was basically some of the teams were involved as at the, at the level three. But this year we jumped four and five levels as being fully implemented into their team strategy. That basically means they're seeing enough gain that they are shifting from this plus something else to saying we're, going to, we're all in as a, as a media movement strategy. Tom, go to the next one if you don't mind. One of the things is beyond just seeing converts and being seeing uh, baptisms, our goal is to drive toward church planting movements. So we want to see what are people looking at for persons of peace, which is a key factor in, a, in leading toward church planting movements. Now, then there's multiple definitions out there of what pe persons of peace are. So we asked the first question said, how would you define a person of peace? And we let it be a free answer, let people answer any way they wanted to. And then we ask them, based upon your own definition, how many persons of peace did you identify over the last year? And if you can see here, about 65, 64% of the people are showing zero to 10 persons of peace per, per year. Now, what we observed from looking at the data, there was not a direct coalition. There is a, there is a relationship between uh, teams that are that this, at the 65 level, which is zero to 10, are generally teams that are within one to two years of launching their strategy. What that basically means is that they're figuring things out. They're getting their Facebook connections. They're getting their, their disciple tools set up. They're getting their filtering teams together. And as they start to get a little healthier and more of the operations in place, then they'll start to see more growth. The teams that are showing greater fruit, the, the, the 10 to 50 per year to 500, and then some of them are showing over 2,000 persons of peace per year, are the ones that are been that are longer than two years. And um, 
And so they're roughly showing, at the, on, let's say on the 50%, they're only four persons a piece per month. Now, these are not just converts. These are converts who are reproducing disciples. Go on, Tom, to the next one. I'm going to move, look at the definitions. Again, letting people be freely defined what they consider to be a person of peace. There are four definitions that kind of emerged. People who are seeking, they look for people who are just seeking, people who are sharing with other individuals. These are seekers who are, are respondents who are sharers. And then some people had both, seeker and sharing, and then there were some unclear ones. What you'll notice that people who, uh, teams who are within the one to two year range have a very tight definition of what they're looking for for a person of peace. People who seeking and sharing. Those teams that are actually showing more fruit loosen up on their definitions and are saying, we're just looking for seekers because once the field connects with them and they meet face to face and they see them become a believer, then they actually start to get into to pivot to, to start opening up their community and become the fuller definition of a person of peace. So if we filter out individuals too early, they never make it to the they never make it to the field. So what we're finding is that people with a lot more experience are opening up their definition and are using it to um, for for seekers only. Tom, go to the next one if you don't mind. One of the other things is we uh, Rebecca mentioned or, or were mentioned earlier is that we're looking for individuals to respond and then moving from groups and then groups of groups as we get involved in movements. One of the things that comes into play as an indicator of a health of an organization is um, is the uh, how much fund how much funds are spending. Teams that are within fifteen thousand dollars or fourteen uh, or fourteen thousand euros which is about that 60% range, the ones that are in first year or second year, they are um, using just project funding. You don't need a lot of funds. They're just figuring out how things will work. Then as they start to see groups and groups of groups, they will start to spend the greater funds for teams, for operations, for, for offices, for filters. And so we can see funding as an indicator of a, of a growth of of the movement. So this tells, again, our initiatives are, are maturing as time goes on. The two that is two movements, as well as people that are near movements, you can see that their funding needs are going to significantly increase because when you get 2000 persons apiece, you need more infrastructure to help support the, the growing movement. Go ahead, Tom, to the next one. Funding actually is correlated with uh, accountability. And this is a healthy, it's a healthy observation. About 50% of the teams, 50% uh, of the initiatives, only the team itself is giving both oversight and raising of the funds. Because again, they're just project funds. And so they're getting the funds and they're off watching over the operations. But as the maturity grows on the initiative, the team and an entity, generally the entity is the organization, it's the area leadership or whatever infrastructure it is, but it's still involved in the mission organization. They're providing oversight for the funds. And then as they start moving more from groups and then groups of groups, it's getting more complex and people start using another infrastructure overlaid over top than the team. And that is an entity other than their team. This could be the church back home. It could be, again, their, their organization. But then 10% are actually becoming a registered charity. And the reason this is healthy is because registered charities generally have to have an operational board or a reporting board. And those have board chairmans, they have uh, financial controllers, they have uh, people who are giving oversight to the over overall operation. This is this is gives to transparency, it gives initiatives, it gives clarity to the operation. But again, 10% of them actually have a, have a registered charity and they're showing very clear accountability on how they're meeting their goals and objectives and spending their funds. Tom, go to the next one, please. Prayer strategy is staying very healthy throughout all three years. And this is good because as we become more task oriented, becoming more metrics, we're becoming more Google, you know, Google mo global movement metrics, there is a tendency for us to start getting involved in thinking that we are in control and it's about systems and strategy. But clearly, the teams are saying, no, this is about the kingdom of God, and we're trying to uh, keep God focused, and we are only his servants, 
we are his branches to his uh, to his vine. So prayer staying strong throughout all three years. And that's a very healthy observation. Tom, go to the next one. So clear observations. We are more than doubling every year. And maybe we are moving to tripling. It, it is growing in a rapid clip. The fastest growth is with non-English speakers. That's a very, again, a very health, healthy growth. And then we're seeing a 400% growth in face-to-face -face and conversions. Uh, and we suspect that over the next couple of years, we're going to be moving that closer to more churches and movements as we are involved with the work. And then we're seeing a rapidly maturing initiatives all across the spectrum. As people get it past their second year, they're seeing more and more fruit occurring. Tom, going to the next one, we're going to look at the recommendations. I think we need to really quickly shift our materials to becoming multilingual and multi-ethnic. We've had it, we've gotten a little lazy and tended to be used more English first, and I think it needs to be shifting. The other thing is that we need to really develop a think tank to think through the funding and structural issues. It's very hard for teams to be doing so much. Facebook ads, digital responders, dealing with persecution, to help them to, to put a burden on them, the idea of the needing great amounts of funds and, and structure oversight. So we need to think through on how we can help the teams develop those. Post-launch and movement coaching is going to be a growing edge. We need more movements coaches as we people get individuals moving to groups and groups of groups, how they can move that into a, a movements coaching. And the last thing is, as Rebecca talked earlier, we need to be expanding our global movement metrics so they can help the team grow in a healthy direction. So that is... Um, that's now into Q and A. Anybody have questions, or I'm not sure who's handling the questions here, Todd Clyde. I gotcha. Great job, Tom and Rebecca and Dr. Frank. Uh, and go ahead. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Brian's helping me as well. The first remarks are actually responded to, but I'll highlight them. Um, Craig was asking about, hey, how can I get access to successful um, examples of ads that are curated, and so. Amber has put in the link two great, great resources. One is a Trello board and one is the Kavanaugh media site that lists uh, basically give away a lot of the work that's been developed by a number of teams around the world. So I'll just point to that. The second remark here is about chat bots. And um, I don't know if, I, I mean, I know we did this thing like a couple of years. Ago. John, I'm going to pick on you. Does anybody on the coalition team have a quick remark about chat bots or a great place to find resources on that? Or is there Anybody, John, Amber, do you guys, Tom, have anything on that? I mean, we're using them uh, for a couple different, I think we have seven or eight teams that use them right now for a couple different reasons are the main parts to it. One is for filtering. Um, when you're getting a lot of messages in, it can really do that top of the level filtering as far as, hey, I wanna argue or I want, I want a Bible or whatever. So we use it in that kind of a way. Um, some, it depends on the platform, though, Clyde, as well. If it's just on Facebook, we can build that into the Messenger bot itself. Right. The other reason we use it, or way we use it fair amount, is for Bible distribution type stuff. So we can do videos, Bible passages in a PDF format, or sending them links to do that or whatever else. But the focus is for scripture, scripture engagement is what the other reason that we use it. Um, chat fuel, mini chat are the two biggest ones that we tend to use. I think I saw that question on there. I used yeah. to be cautious with mini chat, and now it seems like they fixed a few of the issues that were out there that were getting some teams accounts screwed up. So um, anyway, hope, hope that's that. Amber and, or John or anybody, I'm not familiar with anybody that's doing like a community practice around this. Does anybody want to add to that? Amber, Tom, someone. Uh, I will say, well, if one of them want to right. chime in on that, this is Brian. Um, one thing that we have experienced is uh, there are there there's at least one chatbot model that has been uh, replicated out there. Uh, what we've seen with some teams is is a desire to obviously take that and run with it, uh, but really to make it work well, you need to think about how to best contextualize it for your audience. Take those uh, those questions, those uh, dialogue flows and contextualize those for your audience. That's where you're going to see the biggest benefit out of those chatbots, rather than just taking a, a, a model and replicating it, uh, translating it into, into your particular language. You need to contextualize it. 
All right. And then, and thank you for those remarks. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the next. Um, Zakir's asking, hey, is there a gospel message in a picture sketch form that I can use in my context in Bangladesh? I'm looking for a link here to some content resources. I don't know if anybody else can drop some things in that might, you know, and, and there's a ton out there. Uh, we have in our wiki have a, a segment that's just for that. And I'm dropping that in right now. Zakir or anybody else. So you can uh, pull that up. And if somebody else has not a value add, you can put that directly into the chat. Uh, Zakir, I would say um, the global gospel um, has has some things, um, stuff from GNPI is animated. Um, Share the story from TWR Motion has a has some chronological story sets that are they were done in North Africa, but they may, you could look at the the pictures and things. They're very um, sensitive. They're sensitive to Islamic, you know, sensitivities in terms of biblical images. So TWR Motion has some of that. All right. And thanks, Tom. I'm going to move on because there's more coming in. How do you Thank think you. regional hubs can support the health of teams? Frank, you want to comment? Yeah, uh, we're working on setting up hubs in uh, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, Southeast Asia is doing ex extremely well. Uh, East uh, Europe is doing really well. And, uh, and the goal is to for internally people to help support teams all, uh, in their work. So yes, we're working on that. Um, South Asia has not been as developed as we would like to. Uh, I think they're doing better over in East Asia. So in Africa, it's got a really, they're doing a fabulous job, really good job there. So yes, there is hubs being set up for all of these locations. Um, and that's where our end, end goal is that when we start moving uh, more more healthy teens are involved in area. They're going to be actually helping each other grow. And this is that first slide. It's a coalition. It's a coalition who are interconnected and helping each other out. But we're working on developing those out. And I want to add that the key factor in successful hubs are a called and motivated hub facilitator. <laughs> so the ones that exist are because God has clearly called and, and raised up a person or persons that are just care for that. And they're usually local practitioners, but want more to happen. So if you could be that person, reach out to us, uh, and we'll get you connected. And along that lines, I see Joshua's asking contacts in uh, Turkey. Joshua, I think you've already spoken with John. John has contacts there. If anybody else wants to message Joshua directly in the chat about contacts in Turkey, please do so. Craig, to you, Dr. Frank says, you said there's a direct correlation between having a charity and successful media movements. Can you give more details on the type of charity setup? How many members, how many roles? What's the, who's the expert on that, Frank? Uh, we don't have a lot of experts. I'm, I'm working with it. And there's some people that I connect with and try to learn from how, how this can be done. Uh, so I'm deeply, I'm on two boards right now uh, because I'm trying to learn how this 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 relationship goes, but uh, yes, the having a board chairman is important. A board board chairman who not just is a warm body who really understands what we're trying to accomplish, uh, and then you need someone who gives the financial oversight. So, uh, and this is going to be far important when you start moving to the movements level, is because the complexity of what you need to report on. And it is, is, is a growing edge. So as I mentioned, this is why we need a think tank on this because we need to think through what is a board? How can we create a board? What, are, what kinds of boards? There are operational boards. There are reporting boards and, and the list goes on and on. And it's a growing edge. And if you have an expertise or know people have an expertise in board and board activities, you know, please let me know. I want to, grow, I want to continue to grow in this area. All right, and we're going to transition to our case studies, but I saw one more. Uh, this is from John. I'm banned from Facebook ads. Does me being connected to the account cause the page to be less effective? Is it is it just best that I disconnect myself or are there people using other services? John, can you give us 20 seconds on that? Um, the, 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 who was asking this? John uh, Lumgar. Lumgar. Uh, I'm banned from Facebook ads. Me, exactly. Well, it doesn't have any effect on the effectiveness of the ads per se. Those work if they're good. 
So, but it does put the account in at risk when you have anybody that's banned being on those. So I would not recommend that. Um, the accounts that we have in the most secure locations, we don't have anybody attached to them that there's no way to identify those people. And that to me is the best practice. Thanks, John. All right, we're gonna transition. We have two case studies to be shared, one from Asia and then one from Africa. So let's hear from Asia first. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me on to share. I'm gonna share a little bit about my journey with M2M in Asia. Um, if you go to the next slide, for a little context, our team is a team of two families. Uh, so it's a pretty small team and we have been on the field for four years now. Um, we came here with no previous presence or connections um, and our teammates, the other couple do CP training. They got connected to a network of churches out in the provinces. And uh, so they do traveling and training of CP uh, church planning trainings. But my family is has been focused on the urban setting. And our city is somewhere around 20 to 25% of our country's population. And that's actually growing. I think over the past four years or so, it's grown an average of like 5% each year. So it's rapidly growing. Um, as I mentioned, we ha came in with no connections. So uh, we see people doing CP work out in the provinces that they're seeing multiplication, but we're having trouble finding partners in the city. Um, and that's been a big barrier for us. If you go to the next slide. So um, back in fourth quarter of 2021, uh, we began deploying our M2M initiative here, focusing on the city. We uh, began recruitment, and that was kind of difficult. As I said, we don't have a lot of connections, but uh, God led us to this lady um, who is a local gal who is a, a new um, mother. At the time, she had a newborn, and um, she was super excited for the role of being a digital filter because she saw it as a strategic way she could help grow God's kingdom, uh, while also caring for her newborn at home. So it was a very good fit, and we're very grateful uh, for her coming on board with us. So in February of 2022, uh, we began our first ad campaign. And then April and May of 2022, we started our first messaging ads and began receiving messages for the first time. Um, Another great thing is we began meeting with our national M2M team. Uh, we added on a content creator and two multipliers. And then um, our teammate picked up the role of being the prayer coordinator, prayer catalyst. Um, so we began meeting together as doing a missional community, like a three-thirds group. And that's been a huge blessing and an answer to prayer having teammates in our city who want to see uh, disciples multiplied. And unfortunately, at the end of last year, we lost our ad account for four months. So that kind of um, slowed down our progress, but we have it back, praise God, and we're rolling ads again. So, so far we have had a lot of engagement. Um, we've had a few face-to-face -face gospel shares and we have one DBS going. Um, and we had one new believer out in the province. If you uh, go to the next slide. One of the, our big challenges has been that only about 15% of messages we are receiving are coming from the city, despite geolocation targeting. Um, most of our messages are coming from out in the provinces. And so that's been very hard to follow up and get face to face. Uh, so we had to kind of think on our feet and we are using the network of churches out there doing our best to do seeker handoffs to people out in the provinces. But it's very challenging because sometimes it's a two or three point of separation between the person who actually goes and shares the gospel. 
Um, and so it's hard for our M2M team to follow up to hear, um, did the person actually share the gospel? Are they studying the Bible? So follow-up has been very hard for us to keep track of those seekers. Um, another thing is we're looking forward to the future. Uh, we want to integrate our M2M strategy, not just for the city, but because we're getting so much response out in the provinces, we want to integrate it with the church network there a little more and partner together to, we've heard of an idea of hitting a location with ads for two or three weeks before the um, disciple makers out in the province go into that new village. So before they enter a new area, uh, delivering ads for a while to help find people of peace. And then um, we also have been talking about creating a page using similar skills from M2M to try to find believers uh, here in the city who are interested in learning how to share the gospel, make disciples, or join a missional community with us. And that's all. Awesome. Torgan in Asia, thank you so much. We're going to hear from Michael in Africa. Well, hey, guys. Thanks for, um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share. Uh, so I am uh, on the field in West Africa, and I lead our M2DMM initiative um, here. And uh, we launched this. Uh, really about middle of last year. Uh, and it was a little bit different than um, what I typically hear on, on reasons to get started. So, so we have a pretty healthy DMM church planning movement going in, in our country. Uh, God's been really amazing. He's moving, he's blessing it, but just in the rural areas. So we're having a lot of success out in the bush, but almost nothing right in our backyard in uh, the capital city, and then in some of the other larger cities. And so um, we didn't really know what was going on other than, you know, hey, you, we just line up where the Holy Spirit goes. But we thought, you know, hearing about using media, hey, maybe this is, maybe this is a great tool because, you know, here uh, it's like anywhere else in the world, you, look, you, you go around and every young person's got their, 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 you know, their head buried in their phone. And so we figured, hey, let's just meet them where they're at. Um, a lot like the small, the, the, the other team were pretty small. So it's, it's five people myself. We just recently added, uh, a person dedicated to content creation, um, that's, that's remote, um, one local digital filter and two local multipliers. And we are looking to expand, uh, our team as well. The next slide, please. Uh, let me, let me, um, share just a quick story. Um, so we, we launched this initiative, like I said, mid last year. And at the, at the beginning stages, I was really frustrated because I was only getting messages from Christians. And that was not our intent. We're in a country that's 99.5 to 9% Muslim, depending on where, where you look. And I found out how to uh, get a hold of every Christian in the country, but that was not our objective. So I was really beating my head against the wall. And I'll, I'll come back to that in lessons learned. But our very first contact, the very first contact we got was this young man that only lives a couple, uh, the next neighborhood over. Uh, he was a Christian and he wouldn't leave us alone. So he messaged and we kind of explained what we were, we were doing. And uh, he kept messaging. He's really persistent. So we finally agreed to meet face to face. Um, and he's a young believer. He's on fire. And he said, you know, I want to do what you guys do. Like, I want to, I, I want to teach me how to do what you do. And so, uh, to make a long story short, he is now our lead, uh, multiplier. And he's got a group of, uh, of other young people from, from around the city that he's recruited to help him and, and build a network of multipliers. And so, um, God's, God's good. And he's got a little bit of a sense of humor. Um, and, uh, and it's kind of a cool, uh, the last team said, Hey, sometimes, uh, maybe looking for believers to engage is a, is a different spin on it, but, but something that can be really productive. Next slide, please. Yeah. Just a quick snapshot of where we're at progress to date. Um, uh, you can kind of read all all these we've got uh we've had 20 face-to-face -face meetings four that have professed faith one that was baptized finally last friday baptism 
Um, so we're real excited about that. And two, uh, three thirds are discovery Bible study groups that are started. Um, and so we're, we are in the early stages, but we're, but the teams come together. We're starting to see things happen and it's really exciting. Last slide. There we go. So key takeaways. Um, so I talked about at the very beginning, I could only get believers to respond. And that was because I was doing, uh, making all of our content in the trade language instead of the heart language. And I don't know if other people have seen the same thing, but when I switched from um, that trade language to the heart language, which is difficult because I don't speak that, so I had to get some, some help and some translation, all of a sudden the ratio flipped. So it was 80% believers and 20% Muslims that were responding, flipped upside down, 80% Muslims and 20% and believers. So that was... Um, that was a game changer for us. Um, in our context, uh, really very few people are literate. Um, vocal messaging is by far the most effective way to communicate with people. And so what that meant is um, almost all of our interactions, we take people um, from Facebook, from, uh, from that content into a uh, WhatsApp messaging conversation, but it's vocal. Um, again, that uh, that necessitated someone that was fluent in several of those local languages, which God provided, which was awesome, um, but has presented some other technical challenges in terms of CRMs and things like that. So, um, so that's what we've got going on here. And then building the right team is is critical. So it was just me for a while uh, wearing all the hats, um, and as soon as we were able to find the right people, is when we really started to see uh, things take off. So. Um, yeah, we, we were, we're excited to have that. Um, but yeah, let me, let me just stop there and turn it back over. Awesome. And thank you, Turgan and Michael. Really encouraging because these are teams that don't have a ton of resources, but are seeing some positive movement in terms of identifying seekers and persons of peace, and then going beyond that in the beginnings of laying the foundations for potential movements, or in Michael's case, an existing movement being augmented or accelerated by that. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, if you can stop the slide, Tom, uh, this is just a chance for, and I'm gonna pick on John and Amber and Jamie, if you're here and Tom, you know, in light of the things that you've heard, you know, about this research, and I know you guys kind of, Frank and I and Alice and a few others have been in the, in the weeds on this for like three months. So you guys are kind of getting exposed to it somewhat recently. But who among you would just comment like, oh, what surprised you? And if I don't hear a volunteer, I will pick. So if you're on our coalition, do you have a thought? And that includes you, Rebecca. Thoughts, comments, just surprises about what Frank has reported on. I'm going to count to three and choose Tom. Tom, what, what? <laughs> Heard from me I enough. saw that expression. <laughs> I saw the raised eyebrow. Any, any, just quick thoughts or comments on the research as as we've heard it today? No, I, you know, I'm excited. I love to hear the case studies of these just beginning movements. So thanks, uh, Turgan and Michael, about that because it it sort of gives us a realistic expectation. It even the tra the trajectory looks is really encouraging, and the you know Frank clarified that the trajectory we documented is far less than are actually out there, but it's the way we choose to, you know, categorize it um, or measure it. Um, that's exciting because we've seen it over the last, whatever, seven, eight years. That more of us have been talking about this and um, it's just seeing how God is working. So I'm just encouraged by that. And I'm really encouraged by these teams who've been doing it like a year and just see, yeah. seeing Amen. how things are going. Keep so, going. Yep. Jamie, are you here? I can't tell. Uh, yeah, I am. Just go ahead. I'm picking on you next. Yeah, I uh, have been really encouraged to see the uh, the growth between the survey last time and this one, and seeing the especially the numbers of uh, people of peace or potential people of peace that people are finding means that uh, that this. The strategy really is accelerating teams as they move to offline relationships and just finding new problems. Uh, I'm I'm very encouraged by what these results are showing. Awesome, Amber. 
Yeah, I think two things surfaced for me. First of all, it's just super exciting to know that that two movements of God have been birthed um, through this strategy. Um, And also the trend towards um, non-Westerners using this strategy and more nationally focused teams um, is just a significant shift. And I'm excited to see that trend um, continue to move upwards. All right. And John. Yeah, I, I think the uh, funding part of it was the area that I, that Frank brought up that I was the most interested in to doing this. And so I think how people get the partnership part together to pool resources, to figure out how to share together. I mean, even some of these comments or whatever else. And I think I think we're going to, Frank's talked a lot about this, this hockey stick type of things taking off. I I think we're to that point, he would say, to do that. So now we're going to start seeing, okay, what are these more friction points to that? And I do think financing and personnel are probably going to be those, personnel being the local people. I mean, that's the ideal. And I don't think there's anybody that would argue against that. Local language, local people being able to do that. So um, yeah, the funding thing was one of the things I was glad to or interested to see what, what Frank brought out in this. Awesome. Thank you. And Rebecca? Yeah, I think just to reiterate some of um, what has already been said, but just the non-English speakers um, becoming more and more important um, and how they play a role in our essential. Yeah. All right. And I'll just add, I'm a part of the coalition. Have I skipped anybody? And if I have, go ahead and just, I can't, I can't tell who's in here and who's not from our coalition. Anyway, great work, Frank uh, and team. And, and, I, and a special shout out to those who are here who have participated in either this year's survey or a prior year's survey. Um, you know, we're super grateful and, and, it, and it helps us take a picture of where we believe things are at in order to better serve what God is doing going into the future. So I think for me, it's just like, this thing is growing. We really don't know exactly, and that's okay. But we do know that the spirit of God is breathing life into this. And we want to continue to create this community of learners, because just as you heard from these case studies, like, yeah, wow. Okay. Well, uh, we're getting people out in the rural area, but (laughs) you know, we want to, we want to meet people here, you know, in our community where we're living in the urban centers. There's all kinds of things that are always, always evolving. And so it's just exciting that we get to be a part of this. And as Frank emphasized early on, this is a spirit of God thing. This isn't controlled by any entity. You know, we're working together and providing our resources. And I will, if you didn't see, if you're not in the chat, you know, um, Lauren just posted if that link again um, on if you want to get started. There's some other links, but let's go with this. Um, a couple more resources that you can take advantage of. Uh, these are some of the training options, visual story. Um, we provide day, multi-day on-site training. If you've got a group of 25 or more, uh, media to movements, the uh, coaching team and their links in it. Maybe you can, Amber or Lauren, put that back in there just for everybody to have access. Oh, or maybe Lauren can, or somebody with that full URL, media to movements.org slash about with the HTTPS. Uh, that's really helpful. Um, and Tom, yeah, if you can pop that back up once you get it sorted out, that'd be great. Kingdom training, online and in-person workshops to help you get training. Kavanaugh Media, that's John, who you just heard from. He's the guru at Top of the Funnel, digital marketing and management. And um, some more resources. Uh, next slide. If you haven't already, go ahead and maybe Allison, you can drop that HTTPS link in there with forward slash M to M. Um, you can put your resources in that wiki. Next slide. Uh, and here's what that wiki looks like in the media movement section. There's onboarding. A couple of events you may want to be aware of. Um, a number of workshops are taking place at EMDC, the Eurasian Media and Distribution Consultation in Chiang Mai that actually begins this week and continues for the next two weeks. A number of us will be there. And after Next week, there's a post training who's led by Stephen Earp. Stephen, I believe, is here. I don't think it might not be too late if you're going to sign up for that. There's a monthly marketing meetup. We do a top of funnel community of practice every three months. The next one's on June the 20th. Next, Tom. Uh, and a word to those of you who are maybe like me, 
I, I was a field worker and I was very, my day job was making disciples. And now in the last oh, you know, 20 some years, I've been more of a support part of the tip of the spear of the church. And so for those folks who maybe find yourself like me, more so behind a desk and less so involved in investing your life in the lives of others, I would invite you to just seriously consider this. How well are you making disciples where you're at? And so this is a very simple challenge. Challenge, And if you can drop this link in, Allison, go here. And it's how can you, for the next 12 months, identify at least 12 people that you will prayerfully and lovingly invest in. And they may not even know it. You don't have to ask their permission. You get led by the spirit, you identify those people and you pray, lead, love, serve, share verses, whatever that is, so that they can become more like Jesus. It's been transformational for me and many others. And it just gets us, I hopefully, back to where we all should be, which is, you know, go there for make disciples. Uh, and then next slide, Tom, just a reminder of again, and then go ahead and click on uh, I don't know, yeah, all of those. These are just some of the resources that are available for the prior surveys. Again, this survey, that last link, M2M Survey 23, won't be available probably for another 24 hours, but we'll put the survey, the recording, the slide deck, resources, all of that are in there. Uh, and if you've signed up for this, you'll get an email that lets you know when that's available. And uh, we're a little ahead of time, so we're going to end early. But a reminder would be, and you can maybe just stop the slides, Tom, would be um, save the chat before you leave, um, because there's a lot of stuff <laughs> in the chat. So if you haven't done this before, go to the bottom of your chat box. There's the three dot right click or just click on the three dots and then hit the save chat. And then it'll post to your desktop uh, when it's done. And you can go back and pull out those resources or particular comments that people have made, made towards you. A lot of great stuff there. Um, you know, uh, we've got a couple extra minutes. Anybody, uh, and maybe Brian, okay, have I missed anything? Are there any thoughts, comments, questions in the chat that we want to reference before we close? Or if you we have a moment, you can add them now. I have a question, Clyde. This is, uh, this is Mike, uh, hey, part Mike. of the Kenya, the Kenya team. Um, does everybody use disciple tools? I've been in and out, so I'm sorry if I missed something, but, or does, is there other tools out there that people are using? Frank, you want to respond? Cause I, you mentioned that a little bit in your presentation. There is, uh, <clears throat> the team in, in Southeast Asia is using, uh, a software, um, uh, called, um, uh, pulling a blank on it, but it's actually far more complicated. One of the things that when we first launched out, there were two experiments, one in Southeast Asia and one with ever in uh, North Africa. And Gospel Ambition was the ones who developed disciple tools. Um, I don't think anybody's using a tool other than those two very well. There are some Salesforce things, but they get that super complicated. And it doesn't really match really well and it's expensive. But uh, Disciple Tools is the one that, that gives us deepest uh, connection between media that drives deep into the field. So I don't know of any others um, that really work well. <clears throat> so okay. I'm not sure if that's helpful. Again, 55% of the team are using Disciple Tools. A lot of people are trying to stay simple and just write things down on an Excel sheet, which is a great idea. That's, I would encourage you to do that on the front end side. Because when you're first launching, like some of the teams we've mentioned earlier, they need to stay simple because there are so many things to learn. Then as you start to getting uh, a little more foundational, you need better tools to keep you informed. But I'm not sure if that was helpful. Yeah, yeah that was really helpful. One of the things, um, we've kind of stayed away from Disciple Tools. I mean, at first we kind of got into it, started learning how to use it, um, and it's been overwhelming. Um, so I think part of it is um the way that we're marketing the way we're doing our ads we're not filtering enough on the ad front so we're getting too much spam too many kind of people who aren't seriously seeking so that could help us on the front end um, but i still think there's some improvements on the disciple tools end to make things easier right now we're just using kind of like you said an excel sheet or just you know keeping tabs outside of a digital program. So I was just curious if anybody's using anything else. Um, 
Um, but that was helpful. You yeah. Don't have, you don't have to put all the contacts in to DT. So there's a way to do that where you only put them in when you filter them to be able to do that. So that could be one okay. of that. Jamie, I heard another voice and I want to make sure Jamie gets to respond, but I heard another female voice. I don't know if that was Jamie. What that Lauren. Voice was go. Lauren. It was me. Um, yeah, I just wanted to encourage you. I put, dropped in the link that um, I have noticed and worked with several teams that when they start using Disciple Tools, they um, are overwhelmed by uh, maybe not understanding how it was designed to be used. And so oh, I hear a lot of similar challenges like, what do we do with all these messages that are not true seekers? And if you um, are, have ever felt frustrated or um, not sure how to use the tool, we I would love, um, there's other coaches that could help you kind of understand how the tool is intended to be used and work around those things. So there's a lot of solutions and a growing community of people putting a lot of effort into the tool. So um, I encourage no one to really like give up on it yet unless um, you've, it doesn't work at all for you. But like, if you haven't met with a coach or met with someone to help you adapt it around your needs, like customize it, change it for what you need, I highly encourage you to reach out and ask somebody to help you take a look at your disciple tools and customize it for you. Yeah, thanks. Jamie, do I'll you want to do you want to add anything to that, Jamie? If you're still here, I can't tell. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I am. Um, and I thank you, John and Lauren, for both of those comments. And um, I, I guess, just to add, would say that. Are we are 100 as as part of the people who pioneered and created Disciple Tools? We are 100% convinced that anybody who is using media to movements like this is a power tool that you need if you are wanting to get offline and work with a coalition of people to follow up with those contacts. And yet, your comment, Mike, like super helpful. Like, thank you because it's very humbling. But if it's not working for people, um, that's important feedback um, for us to know so that the getting started can be simpler. So, and Lauren has put a lot of work into um, trying to help people do that as well. So, um, thanks for that feedback. And um, yeah, we'll just keep trying to make it uh, clearer. So, thanks for that. And thank you very much. And Brian, I'm so sorry. I missed you, bro. As <laughs> part of the coalition. Brian added, it's encouraging to see the growth in number and diversity of M2M strategies. There is room within M2M for further innovation, creativity, and growth. There is room for many more M2M strategies, even where they already exist, but particularly among the many groups who don't have any active effort. Please spread the word in your organizations. Amen. And amen. And then I'm just trying to read through some of these other comments. If you're in Europe and not yet connected to a hub, please reach out to the One Kingdom team. Uh, yeah, they put a link in there. So yeah, amazing. Like, boy, they've really got a vision for the whole continent. Uh, um, and then uh, Rick, the slides will be in the executive summary. Um, and I guess we're willing, yeah, I, I think, yeah, we're, we're willing to give these away. I mean, we're giving them away. So if you want to use them, <laughs> you can use them. And um, Amber, could you put that onboarding document? I know it's way up in the top of the chat. Just, I don't know if you can drop it in that PDF that was like um, the one that you dropped in earlier. Paul put in a link to the, the save. If you're not able to save the chat, you can do that and download the one that Paul posted and, uh, there. Tom's got his hand raised. And Tom, sorry. Yeah, just very quickly hearing about heart language. I'm afraid I'm not going to be at EMDC, which is a real pain. But uh, if you, yeah, I know um, it's just too far. Uh, let's, I know why, but let's let's talk a bit more about all the people of scripture in the heart language and getting the teams that are starting to move towards scripture engagement and how we can get them to use media to movements more. Because I think this has huge potential. Amen uh especially I as you see the value that. of the heart language i've been trying to get my teams to use it with very limited success um but i'd just like to see more that's basically all i want to say really so thanks this has been really Frank, inspiring and thank you tom and i can't believe you're not going to be at mdc what will it be without you uh frank respond to that or comment if you would the, this is a growing strategy and i almost feel like it's going to be uh, locally, very, very local as to when you flip over to heart language and when you go to trade language. Uh, one, one of our case studies was heart language was critical. We found over in Southeast Asia, trade language was the one that became the, the growing factor. So these are very context uh, oriented. And so 
This is all part of your first two years of learning. Which one works for us? <clears throat> and it may work this year and next year may change. So um, running the ads, it has to be, this is, I think where John talks about, you run, you know, you run an ad and see how it works and then you learn and you switch and you adapt and then you rerun again. Um, all right. And Amber, I was, I think it was the current global. I can't remember, Amber, you're responding in the chat anyway. Uh, I think we're going to bring this to a close. So um, thank you for uh, Frank, first and foremost, for our all months of work and research on this, all those who participated, our presenters, Tom and Rebecca and Turgan and Michael, uh, and then just all, all of the interaction here. So again, this will be posted hopefully in the next 24 hours. We'll email you with the link. It's already, you should have, you, you know, we posted it in the chat. It's available there. Um, we're here to serve, you know, so this whole coalition and a growing ecosystem, we're all about Jesus. So it's not about us and it's about his kingdom coming, his will being done to the ends of the earth as it is in heaven. And so that's why we're here. So grace and peace. Um, hope to see some of you at, anyway at EMDC. And if I could, um, we'll end this meeting, but then maybe in a minute or two, just we'll, we'll, for the team members, if we can do a, a debrief, we'll jump back in uh, after we end the meeting and then jump back in and do a quick debrief. Anybody who was a part of the team or coalition wants to join us, please do so. And here, let me just read, uh, I just, there's a lot of chats here. Um, thanks for the affirmations. Yes, and yes, and yes. All right, grace and peace, God bless. Thank you, bye-bye.